Hey there, it's Ariel Hawani, one-third of the fastest-growing show in combat sports. I'm Chuck Mendenhall. And I'm P.T. Carroll, and together we are 3 Puck. Join us on the Spotify Live app after every UFC pay-per-view and become a part of the best community in mixed martial arts. Or if you can't make it, check out the Ringer MMA Show podcast exclusively on Spotify. See you then. Love yous. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible. Thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by Atlassian. Atlassian software like Jira, Confluence, and Trello help power global collaboration for all teams so they can accomplish everything that's impossible alone. Because individually, we're great, but together, we're so much better. Learn how to unleash the potential of your team at Atlassian.com, A-T-L-A-S-S-I-A-N.com, Atlassian. Tap the banner or visit this episode's page to learn more. Cristiano Ronaldo scored a hat trick in Portugal's opening round match against Spain at the 2018 Men's World Cup in Russia. It was a classic Ronaldo, superhuman, drama queen performance. Portugal had been losing 3-2 for most of the second half, and Ronaldo scored his third goal from a free kick in the 88th minute to claw back a draw. And the free kick itself was magnificent. One of those oddly gentle-looking Ronaldo rockets that arc just enough to end up in the top corner of the net. Listen to the match footage. Electric. It's Ronaldo. Oh, he's done it. He has only gone and done it. Cristiano Ronaldo. Sensational free kick. The team erupts naturally. Ronaldo does his trademark suit celebration. You know, the one where he sort of skips once, then leaps into the air, spins around and throws his hands down just before he hits the ground. Like he's transforming into the Incredible Hulk's brother, the equally incredible yet also strangely merry Hulk. Then his teammates mob him. This big pile of hugging Portuguese players ends up spilling outside the touchline near the barrier around the stands. Like I said, electric. But what I remember about it is not really the goal or the human rotunda of celebrating players. What I remember most is something that happened on the periphery of the celebration. There's one Portuguese outfield player who doesn't join his teammates, doesn't take part in the collective euphoria. It's the defender, José Font. He looks like he wants to take part. This isn't a case of some disgruntled anti-Ronaldo malcontent sullenly refusing to enjoy a great goal. It's weirder than that, actually. Font runs over to the corner flag with his arms outstretched as if he's going to join the group. But before he reaches his teammates, one of them turns back and waves him away. Like, no, not you. Get lost. The incredible yet strangely merry party bus is all full up. Find your own soccer team to celebrate with. So Font ends up standing by the touchline, kind of leaning wistfully toward his teammates while, like, gingerly clapping at them. This only lasts a few seconds, but something about Font's forlornness at this moment always stuck with me. You know how you sometimes hear about, like, really mean junior high kids inviting some other kid they don't like to a party? And the other kid is like, 
oh my gosh, I'm finally part of the cool crowd. And then it turns out that the whole point of the party is just to torment that kid. That never happened to me, thankfully, in junior high. If I have one thing in common with all of you, with all the listeners of this podcast, it's that we're all extremely socially desirable, beloved, I think, really. I know personally, I possess a certain indefinable cool, I believe it's fair to say. At least no one has ever tried to define it in my hearing. I assume they're too intimidated. The point is, congratulations to us, especially you, but also especially me, for being terrific. Well, anyhow, this moment with Font after Ronaldo's goal kind of has that we-don't-like-you-party vibe to it. It's like, imagine a bunch of Portuguese 10-year-olds in a room, and they're all, ugh, Font, I hate that guy. And then the lead 10-year-old, the head of the gang, calls them to order and says, all right, here's what we're going to do. I have a plan to humiliate José Font. Step one, we all devote our lives to becoming world-class soccer players. Step two, Cristiano, you have to become arguably the greatest player of all time. Do you think you can manage that? Good. Good. Step three, we spend the next 20 odd years systematically being really nice to Jose. We make him think we care about him. We make him think he's one of us. We make him think we like him for who he is. That idiot will never see through the trick. Step four, we qualify for the 2018 World Cup, and so forth. And then, at the most dramatic possible moment, they turn to him like, you actually fell for it. You fell for it. You idiot. And then they all retire and move on to their next prank. Okay. Okay, okay. So what's actually happening with Font in this moment. There's a surprising amount of debate around the issue. It turns out the best guess seems to be that the team is trying not to run afoul of FIFA's rules involving goal celebrations and restarts after goal celebrations. They think they'll get penalized in some way if all 10 of their outfield players end up out of bounds. So they're trying to make sure one guy, Font, stays on the pitch. What rule are they anxious about? Well, it's not 100% clear that they know. So goal celebrations are covered under Law 12 of FIFA's Rules of the Game. Maybe you remember we talked about this law way back in our first episode when we were talking about players taking their shirts off after they score. Maybe you listened to that. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you were busy going to parties and hobnobbing with celebrities on boats, which, of course, I would totally understand. Anyway, Law 12 recap. Law 12 says this about celebrating goals. Quote, Players can celebrate when a goal is scored, but the celebration must not be excessive, end quote. It then goes on to lay out some scenarios in which celebration is excessive. You can't climb the perimeter fence. You can't put on a mask, though that would be awesome. That kind of thing. There's nothing in there about the whole team not being allowed to leave the field of play. For the most part, as long as you leave all of your clothes on and don't make any gestures that could be construed as supportive of mid-20th century fascism, you're fine. It's a low bar. Soccer players don't always clear it, but still. So, Law 12 says nothing that would suggest 
poor Jose Font needs to lurk outside the huddle like the protagonist of a Hank Williams song about a sad center back who's drinking his pain away at this honky tonk slash Russian soccer stadium because he can't hug his teammates. Scrap that theory. A more plausible theory for why the team rejected Font is that the Portuguese players think Spain will be able to restart play without them if they all leave the pitch. In other words, one player has to stay on the pitch to stop Spain from stealing a free goal. This is totally wrong if that's what they thought. Post-goal restarts are covered by FIFA's Law 8. I'm not going to get into it, but basically, every player has to be in their own half before the kickoff can happen. Font does not have to be the man of constant sorrow just to stop Spain from taking a quick kickoff. Which kind of makes the whole thing more sad, in a way. The point I am gently corkscrewing toward here is that goal celebrations are moments that defy the normal logic, the normal order of soccer games. They're simultaneously peak moments in the game and moments of unrestrained emotion that threaten to escape the game or run away with the game. You can see that strangeness in the fact that FIFA has multiple paragraphs of rules trying to control expressions of uncontrolled joy. This is how you're allowed to experience transcendent happiness is a weird thing to say to someone. Transcendent happiness is always a little bit outside the rules, a little bit beyond the rules even when everyone technically obeys them, which is maybe why you can end up with a scene like this, where a team made up of veteran international players seemingly gets confused about how they are and aren't allowed to celebrate. It's a little unnatural. You can tell a hurricane to behave in accordance with paragraph 4, subsection 23, but hurricanes don't understand paragraphs, And as for subsections, get out of here. Please don't actually get out of here. This is the kind of party where we all like each other. I'm Brian Phillips, by the way. Welcome to 22 Goals, the story of the World Cup. This is not a soccer podcast. This is a celebration of us. We talk a lot around here about joy, about the joy of soccer goals, about the joy of trying to teach tropical storms to read legal documents. And today we're here to talk about a vital aspect of joy, how you express it. We're here to talk about the goal celebration, one of the most delightful, one of the most special traditions in soccer. Also one of the most confounding, especially if you're a Portuguese center back. Italy went into the 1982 World Cup in Spain as something of an afterthought. Italian soccer was still reeling from a big early 80s match-fixing scandal that consumed Serie A for a couple years. Match-fixing scandals in Italian soccer break out at regular intervals, sort of like the swarms of cicadas emerging from the earth. In the Italian farmer's almanac, it's all phases of the moon and late frosts and Juventus bribing referees. Italy went to Spain and proceeded to look thoroughly underwhelming in Group 1. They sputtered to three consecutive draws against Poland, Peru, and the indomitable Lions of Cameroon. They only made it out of the group thanks to their having scored one more goal than Cameroon. That was Roger Milla's first World Cup. They turned things around. Italy beat Argentina. That was Diego Maradona's first World Cup. They then shocked one of the great Brazil teams 3-2 in one of the best World Cup matches ever. They made the final against West Germany. In the final, they went up 1-0 in the 57th minute from a goal by Paolo Rossi. 
And then in the 69th minute, the team executed an intricate passing move to break into the German box. The Italian sweeper, Gaetano Sharea, swapped the ball back and forth around the goal with the defender, Giuseppe Bergomi. And finally, Sharea passed the ball to the midfielder, Marco Tardelli. With the German defender, Baron Forster, closing in on him, Tardelli took one slightly clumsy touch, then shot the ball by sliding into it like it was home plate. Goal. Great goal, actually. Tardelli then did something that millions of soccer fans would remember much more vividly than they remembered that great goal. He celebrated. Until it comes to Tardelli. And they pick their moment. Marco Tardelli expressing what it's like to score in a World Cup final. Tardelli sprinted toward the Italy bench, shaking both fists, screaming his head off, and sweeping his head back and forth. In the video, he looks like a bear chasing you down a forest path, but like the happy version of that. He looks like a bear chasing you down a forest path to let you know your invention just crossed the production threshold on Indiegogo. You did it. Your combination waffle iron slash guitar tuner is going to exist in the world, and no one believed in you except your friends the Bears and your lawyer, Hurricane Francine. Tardelli's dash of jubilation became the most celebrated goal celebration in World Cup history. There were no memes in the modern sense in 1982. GIFs were not a thing. The internet was a single chat room where three scientists at MIT debated the lore of the 1981 text-based adventure game Zork 2. I'm sorry if you're in the dark about what Zork 2 is. It's fine. You're going to be eaten by a Gru. Don't worry about it. The point is, the channels that we take for granted now in the cultural adoption of images did not exist in 1982. But Tardelli's run... Tardelli's fists, Tardelli's scream, were such a pure embodiment of a feeling. They seemed to distill the joy of scoring a game-winning goal in a World Cup final, because Tardelli's goal was the game winner. Italy went on to win the match 3-1. They seemed to distill all the joy of sports into one five-second video clip. And even though you couldn't post Tardelli's run on 1980s Instagram with a caption like, me when the supply-side economics hits, you could still respond to it. And people did. People in history had their own crude version of the internet. It was called remembering things. Here's what Tardelli later said about this moment. After I scored, my whole life passed before me. The same feeling they say you have when you are about to die. The joy of scoring in a World Cup final was immense, something I dreamed about as a kid, and my celebration was a release after realizing that dream. I was born with that scream inside me. That was just the moment it came out. Could you please put that quote on my tombstone? There is a question hanging over this episode like FIFA's Law 12 over your good mood. The question is, what do goal celebrations add to goals? What do they give us that wasn't already there? Why do we enjoy them so much? And I hear you answering those questions because you have good observations. It's one of the things I like about you. I hear you saying, well, good grief, Brian. It's not rocket science. It's fun to watch a happy person express their happiness. Were you, Brian, not fun to watch when you celebrated after finally beating Zork 2? (sighs) I apologize for that reference. I'm sorry, it just came out. It's a computer game, text-based, adventure, Infocom, 1981. There's a volcano gnome. Don't worry about it. Also, I never beat Zork 2 because it's a notoriously hard game. And I spent the 1980s as a very small and lazy child. Yes, 
It is fun to watch happy people being happy. We don't have to overthink this. A few episodes ago, when we talked about Roger Milla dancing at the corner flag after scoring at the age of 38, you don't need a PhD in affect theory to understand why that was such a joy to watch. Meanwhile, someone with a PhD in affect theory is listening to this and going, oh yeah, well I beat Zork too, so who's laughing now, pal? In the first match of the 2002 Men's World Cup, Senegal versus France, the late Papa Bouba Diop, the Senegalese defender who died way too young in 2020, Papa Bouba Diop shot the ball from close range. The French goalkeeper Fabien Barthez blocked the shot. Bouba Diop got the rebound and scored. First goal of the tournament ended up winning the game for Senegal. Scenes. And Senegal had scored the first goal of the 2002 World Cup. After half an hour's play, Papa Bouba Diop. Just look at this celebration. Bouba Diop pulled off his shirt, sprinted toward the corner flag, laid his shirt down gently on the ground, smoothed it out, called the whole team over, formed them in a circle around the shirt, and then led them in a group dance. Why was that fun to watch? Because it was a group dance around a shirt. Here is the title page of my dissertation submitted to the faculty of the university of this thing we call life in partial fulfillment of the requirements of the degree of Doctor of Philosophy 2022 because it was a group dance around a shirt by Brian Phillips. No page two, no bibliography. Title page is the dissertation. Let's keep going. In the 1994 Men's World Cup in the United States, the great Brazilian striker Bebeto scored against the Netherlands. So this is Bebeto. And that's the second goal. The Dutch can't believe it. Bebeto and his wife had a new baby born just days earlier, and Bebeto celebrated his goal by rocking an imaginary baby. Everybody does that now. Back then, it was new. Why was it so wonderful to watch? Wild guess. Because it was a baby. Because it was a baby, colon, a philosophical investigation submitted to the faculty, etc., etc., dissertation written on a napkin, acknowledgments section at the bottom of the napkin, acknowledgments reads, sincere thanks to babies. 1998, Denmark's Brian Laudrup scores against Brazil. Brian Laudrup makes it 2-2! Celebration starts like a normal run to the flag, but then Laudrup slides to the ground, props his head on his hand like he's posing for a centerfold, and affects a blank expression like he's too cool to care. On the ironic subversion of expectations, colon, the joy of watching serious matters treated lightly and light matters treated seriously, colon, a dissertation submitted to the faculty, no page two, dissertation typeset in Comic Sans. 2002, again, Nigeria's Julius Agahawa scores a brilliant header against Sweden. Cue the trademark celebration. Cue the trademark celebration. Aga Howe is famous for doing gymnastics routines after he scores. Now he spreads his arms and unleashes a run of six back handsprings. I count six, followed by a backflip. I enjoy it when someone does a backflip, colon. What do you want from me, colon? I'm a person, not a robot, colon. An empirical study into the nature of pleasure by Brian Phillips. Title page is followed by a flipbook animation of a dude doing a backflip, and then the dude lands, and as you keep flipping the pages, his tongue slowly slides out of his mouth, and he blows a giant raspberry at the academic committee. 
2014, the USA's John Brooks scores an 86th minute header to steal a last gasp win against Ghana. Brooks puts his hands to his head in disbelief, then gently lowers himself to the grass where he lies face down, completely overwhelmed by the moment. Sometimes it's all too much, colon. Nothing after the colon except a map leading to a bathroom through the door of which I can be heard weeping and occasionally murmuring, a dissertation by Brian Phillips. I demand tenure at Oxford immediately. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. You might say all kinds of stuff when things go wrong, but these are the words you really need to remember. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. They've got options to fit your unique insurance needs, meaning you can talk to your agent to choose the coverage you need, have coverage options to protect the things you value most, file a claim right on the State Farm mobile app, and even reach a real person when you need to talk to someone. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. This podcast is brought to you by AT&T Fiber with AllFi. Something tells me that the guy watching sports for 13 hours straight on Sunday, who then stays up watching the recaps of those 13 hours, then calls his friends to talk about it, is definitely going to notice that half a second delay. Get AT&T Fiber with AllFi and watch sports any time of day from anywhere in your house. Live like a gagillionaire. Limited availability in select areas. Go to att.com slash hypergig to check eligibility. Coverage may require extenders at additional charge. There's a story I always loved about the modernist writer Gertrude Stein when she was in college. She took a philosophy class from the Harvard professor William James, the eminent thinker and brother of the novelist Henry James. And on the day of the final exam, it was a beautiful day, Stein sat down in the classroom, got out her pen, and wrote, Dear Professor James, I am so sorry but really, I do not feel a bit like an examination paper in philosophy today. And then she got up and left, and Professor James gave her an A. Because of course, that answer contains a richer and deeper understanding of philosophy than a 60-page essay full of technical language. He wrote her a postcard that said, Dear Miss Stein, I understand perfectly how you feel. I often feel like that myself and gave her the highest grade in the course. Gertrude Stein, just the all-time greatest, the Diego Maradona of cutting class, the Lionel Messi of outwitting the system. But really, I do not feel a bit like an examination paper in philosophy today is the philosophy of the goal celebration. It's the elation of vanquishing seriousness. I mean, you can object to goal celebrations if you really want to for some reason. You can say, well, we watch sports to see gifted people perform difficult feats, and there's nothing difficult about running in a straight line while pumping your fists. And that's true. I myself, can run in a straight line while pumping my fists successfully like four times out of five, or you can argue that players should be classier, that back in the Victorian era, the heavily mustachioed soccer stars of the day only frowned manfully after scoring goals, maybe shook hands with a single teammate while both wearing long pants, to which I say, indubitably, my good sir, but put all those arguments on one side and then put one backflip on the other side. I am so sorry, but I really do not feel a bit like pretending this is an argument. Okay, big news. I have just downloaded Zork 2. Someone posted the source code online. Zork 2 is a very early computer game. The company that made it was called Infocom. 
possibly the most early 80s computing ass collection of syllables possible to assemble in one word? Infocom. They were famous for this line of just delightful text-based adventure games that they published in the 80s. Douglas Adams, the author of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, he was a huge fan and helped them make a hitchhiker's game at one point. When I was in, like, sixth grade, I thought that game was the most sublime piece of art ever crafted by human hands. I still kind of think so. I remember one year for my birthday, my parents knew I was really into these games, and they got me a whole box full of them, probably seven or eight titles, which seemed like an unbelievable windfall at the time. Like I opened the box and a golden radiance shone up onto my face, like my parents had wrapped the briefcase from Pulp Fiction. 80s computer games, that's what was in the briefcase. Mystery solved. I got Plundered Hearts. I got Wishbringer. I got a Mind Forever Voyaging. Honestly, I think the games probably cost about $6.99 a pop at that point because someone had gone out and invented computer graphics and the bottom was falling out of the whole text game industry. Ask me about Blogspot sometime. Anyway, one of the games in that birthday stash was Zork 2 way, way too hard for me as a 12-year-old. It was set in a fantasy milieu, swords, etc., but with a comic spin. There was a ruler called Lord Dimwit Flathead, which to me, at 12, was like the Sistine Chapel of jokes. Sublime. Zork 2 as a whole was way too hard for me, partly because I hadn't played Zork 1, and partly because I didn't have a clue what I was supposed to be doing at any moment. Zork 2 famously dropped you into the game with no clear objective and didn't give you any hints about what your goal was or what the story was or how you were supposed to play. Okay, should I fire this up? Hang on, if I beat this, I'm doing the Marco Tardelli celebration in my living room. Oh yeah, here we go. Booting up, it says. Inside the barrow. You are inside an ancient barrow hidden deep within a dark forest. The barrow opens into a narrow tunnel at its southern end. You can see a faint glow at the far end. All right, I remember this. I am inside an ancient barrow hidden deep within a dark forest. This is so cool. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. Let's see, what's around me? A sword of elvish workmanship is on the ground. A strangely familiar brass lantern is lying on the ground. Okay, I'm taking the sword, obviously. Take, sword, taken. One of the big running narratives in Infocom games is that there are these creatures called grues, like gruesome minus the um, which are absolutely ferocious, but terrified of light. And if you walk into a dark place, you inevitably end up getting eaten by a gru. So we're going to want to nab that lantern too. Let's see. The barrow opens into a narrow tunnel. I think we should go into the tunnel. Enter tunnel. It says, I don't know the word tunnel. Huh. Apparently Zork 2 is narrated by Siri's dad. I'm walking south. You are standing at the southern end of a narrow tunnel where it opens into a wide cavern. Let's go south again. Okay, we're on an underground footbridge over a deep ravine, crossing the bridge. Oh wow, okay, this is so cool. We've entered the Great Cavern. I have no idea what that is or why I'm underground. It says, stalactites, stalagmites, phosphorescent moss, weird shadows move all around you. 
Let's keep on the path. Hmm, okay. It says, you have moved into a dark place. It is pitch black. You are likely to be eaten by a Gru. Well, that's not what we want. Did I forget to take the lantern? Yes, I realize now that I forgot to take the lantern. However, I am actually not too worried about this because I remember this spot from when I was 12, and I'm nearly positive that if I keep going, I'm going to come to some phosphorescent moss in the next room. And phosphorescent moss, my friends, is a foolproof Gru repellent. The cave is always darkest before the phosphorescent moss. I'm going to keep going. This is going to be fine. Go south. You have been eaten by a Gru. You have died. Huh. That's disappointing. At least we know what's going on my tombstone. The scream that has been inside of me from birth, which I let out when I fell into the slavering jaws of a Gru. The game's restarting. You are inside an ancient barrow, hidden deep within a dark forest. Well, you know who wasn't hidden inside an ancient barrow, hidden deep within a dark forest? Marco Tardelli in 1982. Marco Tardelli. Born in 1954, he was 27 when the World Cup kicked off in Spain that year. He was born in the north of Italy in Tuscany. Family didn't have a lot of money. His dad worked for the Italian State Road Network. Marco was the youngest of four brothers. As a kid, he had to play soccer on the sly because his mom didn't want him to become a footballer. Whoops, he failed at auditions with Bologna, Fiorentina, and AC Milan before finally signing as a youth player at Pisa to make ends meet while he was training in Pisa. He worked as a waiter in a restaurant near the Leaning Tower. If you look up a photo of him, you'll see he has kind of an exaggerated soccer body. His torso is kind of short and slight, and then he's got these long, incredibly massive-looking legs probably from all those trips bussing dishes back to the kitchen from table 16. He spent most of his career at Juventus, where he blossomed into one of the great Italian midfielders of his generation. The Italian schemes of that era were very defense first, and his job was to bridge the gap between defense and attack. He did this extremely well, won almost everything there is to win, five Italian titles with Juventus, two Italian Cups, a European Cup, a World Cup. Affect on the pitch, and also off the pitch, was powerful, yet sort of tightly wound. He could never sleep the night before a game. He said it wasn't because he was nervous. He just didn't feel tired. He used to drive roommates crazy on away trips because he wanted to stay up and talk all night. Italy eventually started giving him a room to himself, and he'd end up wandering out into the hall at like four in the morning so he could knock on the coach's door or another player's door and find someone to talk tactics with till the sun came up. Before the tournament in 1982, Tardelli was in kind of rough shape. He'd been injured. He'd been playing a lot of matches, and the game took a toll on him, partly due to his hard-charging style of play and partly because the human body does occasionally need sleep to function. Pro tip, get some rest. He talks when he looks back on his famous goal these days about how the Italian media wasn't convinced he should even be in the Italy squad for the tournament. So when he scored his goal in the World Cup final and, as he says, saw his life flash before his eyes the way dying people do, his brain had a lot to work with. He saw all the obstacles he'd overcome, all the doubts, all the questions, and the feeling of scoring in the final and definitively putting all those ghosts of negativity to rest. He said it felt like he'd gone 
quote, beyond madness. He's running toward the touchline, pumping his fists, screaming. You can picture this, I think, even if you've never seen it. The essence, the absolute of sports joy. And you know, the funny thing about Tardelli, something I've always liked about him, is that he's this emblem, this icon of euphoria, of expressing pure ecstasy. But his personality, the way he talks about and thinks about this stuff, it's very existentialist. It's a little dark. He's thoughtful. He says a lot of stuff you could imagine, like Monica Vitti saying in a voiceover in a Michelangelo Antonioni movie, sort of bleak mid-century ruminations on human fate. Exhibit A, beyond madness. Exhibit B, I was born with that scream inside me. Something else Tardelli has said about the moment after he scored his goal, that he felt completely alone. He says everything went quiet like he was in a silent film. He says, quote, What has remained inside of me is this solitude. It's not a solitude that implies unhappiness. Instead, it was absolute ecstasy. Happiness lived out alone. I was with the others, but I was alone because I couldn't hear anything. It's difficult to describe. It's true. There is no doubt that a man is born alone and dies alone. B plus from William James, I think, for this philosophy paper. Full credit to Marco for staying in and taking the final. But The other thing that occurs to me when I listen to Tardelli's thoughts about that moment, he's identifying a kind of loneliness that's different from the loneliness of someone at a we don't like you party. And he's identifying a kind of darkness that doesn't end in getting eaten by a Gru. Do you remember the question we asked earlier, the Law 12 question? Question is, what do goal celebrations give us that we don't get from watching the goals by themselves? I said we're not going to overthink this. We've already gotten like five PhDs from this episode. But my guess is that it has to do with loneliness. I think it has to do with a feeling each of us has somewhere that we're alone. I mean, sympathetic identification is a huge part of what we get from watching sports. That's obvious, right? We invest ourselves in certain athletes, in certain teams. We make their success and failure our success and failure. We feel an echo of what it's like to be them on the pitch. We celebrate with them. We mourn with them. We all have this tricky thing inside us where when we look at another person, we put ourselves in their shoes, at least to an extent. You shiver when you watch someone step into an ice bath, when you watch someone eat a piece of party cake, you imagine what it tastes like. And sports, for whatever reason, has the ability to widen that aperture a little bit. It makes us more open to feeling with other people, to feeling what other people feel. I remember this one time a few years ago, right after my wife and I moved away from L.A., and bought our current house in central Pennsylvania. Our current house has a yard. Not a huge yard by any means, but it's kind of pretty. It's got a little pond and a weeping cherry tree and then a border made up of these sort of half-buried stones. I like it. Our little dog, Lily Bean, had never lived in a place with a real yard before. We got her in L.A. We're not billionaires. She'd been to the dog park a lot. She's a whippet, so she's bred for speed. She loves zooming around. But she'd never had a place of her own to zoom around in. City dog. So at first, she didn't really understand what the yard was. We'd go out there and she'd be like, well, this is certainly interesting. 
What does it do? Is there a manual? Granted, I can only read on a hurricane level, but I could use some guidance here. All this untrammeled, green, soft space under my feet. So finally, one day, I was like, we're going to figure this out. So I took her outside and got her to run along next to me. We start sprinting in circles. Well, I'm sprinting. She's gently trotting. I'm looking down at Lily Bean like, do you get it? Do you get it? And she's looking up at me like, oh, it's for this. I know how to do this. And you could just see this wild happiness seize her whole body. And she just just starts rocketing around and around the yard, 100% having the time of her life. And I am not really a sprinting in circles enthusiast under normal circumstances. I'm more of a sitting in the shade with an old fashioned, trying not to look at my phone sort of person. But Lily Bean is feeding off my energy. I'm showing her how to do it, we're playing, and I end up feeding off her elation. So we're just flying all over the place, grinning at each other, super hilarious scene if you were spying on me with an overhead drone, but sincerely wonderful if you were living in it. So at one point, I'm running as fast as I can from one side of the yard to the other. I'm making a little da noise to entertain Lily. So in a way, I'm sprinting in a straight line, pumping my fists, and screaming. At that moment, I feel something hard hit my toe, and I lose my balance slightly. I wouldn't say my life flashed before my eyes, but the part of my life when I completely forgot about the border of half-buried stones that formed a major tripping hazard in my yard, that part definitely flashed before my eyes. And my brain went, well, you've just tripped on one of those stones, presumably, but don't worry, my brain said calmly as I'm starting to, like, lurch forward. It's fine. I've gamed out all the possible scenarios here. You're probably not going to lose your balance. And if you do, it's no big deal. You're just going to catch yourself with your hands before you hit the ground. Whatever happens, you are not going to land on your face. Okay, I said to my brain, I'm ready for this. I seem to have become airborne and am now slowly spiraling through the air like a touchdown pass. But as you so wisely suggest, brain, I will catch myself with my hands. I am not going to land on my face. When I woke up, an indeterminate amount of time had passed and I was lying on my face on the concrete at the edge of the yard. There's a concrete sidewalk past the stones. Lily Bean is standing over me, wagging her tail, like, to let me know she's really enjoying this new phase of the game, and if I would like to lose consciousness again, she's here for it. I have indeed flown some distance through the air and landed on the sidewalk face first. I told you I could only do four out of five straight line fist pumping sprints. It's not the end of the world. I'm all scraped up, got a couple scars. I'm fine. The point is, that was a bad experience, obviously. But looking back, this is a happy memory for me. I remember it as a good day. The universe loves to go, ha ha ha, you fell for it, you moron, you idiot as it pulls the ground out from under you. But it was worth it for those few minutes when my little dog and I got to have a blast showing each other how to play in the yard. What it comes down to, I think, is that we're all trying pretty much all the time to figure out how to feel, what to think, how to interpret the world around us. 
Social media kind of gives you the impression that most people are fiercely confident opinion machines who always know their own minds. But I don't think most people are like that at all. I think most of us spend most of our lives feeling like we're inside an ancient barrow hidden deep within a dark forest. And there are no instructions telling us where to go or what we're doing here. And we're looking for any hint that will help us avoid being eaten by a group and a goal celebration, it's a clue. It's a candle. It's a guide to how to feel. Because of the sympathetic identification we feel with athletes, because of our openness to sharing their emotions, a goal celebration makes the joy of the goal more complete. It lets us take their happiness in the same way we take their athleticism in or their grace in. If that sounds like overthinking, well, I was born with this doctoral dissertation inside me, and this is the moment when it happened to come out. But a good goal celebration helps unite you with other people during one of sport's peak moments. It's a little bit outside the game, but it's also at the heart of the game. It makes you, it makes us, less alone. This is 22 Goals, the story of the World Cup. Written by me, Brian Phillips. The executive producers of 22 Goals are Chris Ryan, Juliet Littman, and Sean Fennessy. Our story editor is Connor Nevins, and the show was produced by Devin Ronaldo, Mike Wargon, and Vikram Patel. Copy editing by Jacqueline Cantor. Fact checking by Kellen B. Coates. If Kellen did a back handspring every time he caught me getting a number wrong, he would qualify for the Olympics. That is not a joke. The sound design in this episode is by Devin Ronaldo, who also composed the theme song and many of the music tracks. We also used some music from Epidemic Sound, additional mixing by Scott Somerville, art direction and illustration by David Shoemaker. Match footage from FIFA. Thanks for listening. Dragon Room. A huge red dragon is lying here, blocking the entrance to a tunnel leading north. Smoke curls from his nostrils and out between his teeth. Your sword has begun to glow very brightly. Well, time to be a hero. Slay dragon with sword. Dragonhide is tough as steel, but you have succeeded in annoying him a bit. He looks at you as if deciding whether or not to eat you. Huh. Stab dragon in eye. You've made him rather angry. You had better be very careful now. Careful, eh? Stab dragon in eye again. Why am I typing again? That captured his interest. He stares at you balefully. The dragon tires of this game. With an almost bored yawn, he opens his mouth and incinerates you in a blast of white hot dragon fire. You have died. Huh, you know, at least we got his attention.